Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, we would like to begin by acknowledging that the land the Getty inhabits today was once known as Tovangar, the home of the Gabrieleño Tongva people. We show our respects to the Gabrieleño Tongva people, as well as all First People, past, present, and future, and honor their labor as caretakers of this land. The Getty commits to building relationships with the Gabrieleño Tongva community, and we invite you to acknowledge the history of this land and join us in caring for it. Hello, everyone. My name is Michelle Sullivan, and I'm the Associate Conservator for Drawings here at the Getty. It's my pleasure to welcome you to today's event, The Decorated Page, The Arts of the Book in the Persian World, presented by Masame Farhad, Curator of Persian, Arab, and Turkish Art at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. This program complements the current exhibition, Drawing on Blue, which is on view in our West Pavilion Plaza Level Galleries through April 28th. The exhibition will remain open today until 5.30 p.m. for viewing, so we hope that many of you will take the opportunity while you're here to take a look. Before I get started, I have just a few notes to share. For guests here in the auditorium, please take a moment to silence your mobile devices. For our online attendees, closed captioning has been enabled on Zoom. To access the live captioning, click the CC icon on the Zoom menu bar at the bottom of your screen. And time permitting, we may be able to take questions. For our audience online, please use the Q&A function on your Zoom menu bar. And for those who are here in person, there will be a mic available. So please wait until the mic is brought to you to ask your questions so that everyone can hear. And now a little bit about today's speaker. Uh, Masume Farhad is the Ibrahimi Family Curator of Persian, Arab, and Turkish Art and senior, research, and senior Director for Research at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Asian Art. She is a specialist in the arts of the book from 16th and 17th century Iran and has curated numerous exhibitions. These have included The Art of Persian Courts, Falnama, The Book of Omens, and The Art of the Quran, Treasures from the Museum of Turkish and Islamic Arts. In addition to these publications, uh, associated publications with these exhibitions, she has also published Slaves of the Shah, New Elites in Savafid, Iran, and A Collector's Passion, Ezat Malek, Sudavar, and Persian Lacquer. And now, without further ado, please help me welcome Masame Farhad. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for being here on a beautiful Sunday afternoon. I uh, wanted to take the opportunity to thank uh, Michelle Sullivan and Adina Adams for inviting me to come and talk today and also for including me in a workshop that they had last year on color. Um, it really was a, a wonderful experience and I must say opened my eyes to color not only in Western art, but also in the arts of the, um, that I study uh, myself. So thank you for that opportunity. I also want to congratulate both Adina and Michelle for a beautiful exhibition. And please make a point of going and seeing it. It is, um, it is wonderful. So thank you. It is better to color paper, for whiteness brings great harm to the eyes. This is the advice of the 16th century author Ali Serafi in his treatise on calligraphy. Colored surfaces, whether parchment or paper, have played a critical role in the arts of the book of the Islamic world long before the statement. Not surprisingly, their function differs from colored paper in Europe. As Adina Adams and Michelle Sullivan have highlighted in their thoughtful exhibition, blue paper, for example, offered European artists a middle tone on which they used chalk, charcoal, pencil, and ink to explore the subtleties of chiaroscuro effect on a youthful face, on a uh, sun-drenched landscape, or a contorted human body, as you see um, on the screen. These works range from simple sketches, drawings, to metic meticulously conceived independent works. In Iran and the rest of the region, 
colored paper, other than in tan or cream, was largely used for writing. It provided scribes an ideal ground for the twists and turns of the calligraphic strokes, and later complemented and enhanced the written word in borders and margins. Also, unlike examples in drawing on blue, compositions on colored, colored sheets in Iran were not autonomous works, but part of a larger assemblage, the codex or the book. With a given text as a starting point, the tonality of the paper, the density of the ink, the vibrancy of the painted images, and the uh, intricacy of the decoration all complemented each other to create a rich and varied visual experience. The more elaborate manuscripts required a team of skilled artists, calligraphers, illuminators, painters, binders, and of course, paper dyers, who would plan and coordinate on a project from its conception to completion. As the production of these texts required considerable human and economic resources, they were usually created in workshops associated either with princely or with royal, uh, uh, royal households. The folios that I'm showing you on the screen are um, in the Freer Gallery uh, in Washington, D.C. I'm trying to sort of promote my institution here a little bit. They were uh, commissioned by Sultan Ebrahim Mirza, the nephew and son-in-law of Shah Tahmas, the ruler of Iran from 1524 to 1576. Once completed, such volumes became part of libraries, and in the case of Qur'ans, were often donated to religious institutions as gift. In other words, these manuscripts were far more than simple transcriptions of a certain text. Before discussing colored paper, let's take a quick look at colored parchment. With the advent of Islam in the seventh century, the most important manuscript to be transcribed was, of course, the Quran, the holy text of Islam. Until the 11th century, the Quran was only copied on parchment. According to a recent study by Marcus Fraser, the earliest known examples of colored parchment are datable to the late 8th century, and I'm showing you an example on the screen. Today, these folios are either faded or miscolored to a strange orange red but Fraser argues that they were originally purple and inspired by Byzantine models, much like the more better known and celebrated Blue Koran. The subject of much scholarly debate, the multi-volume Koran, which is now partially dispersed, has been attributed to mid 10th century, either North Africa or Islamic Spain. As scholars have suggested, the choice of a deep indigo blue for the Quran must also draw on Byzantine models, for whom the colors red, purple, and indigo carried particular symbolic significance, and purple was reserved for royal usage. Quran's on colored parchment, however, are rare, as the production was costly and labor intensive. First, it required hundreds, if not thousands of pieces of hide that had to be cured, scraped, cleaned, sanded, stretched, and dried, according to Sheila Blair. Dyeing them was even more complicated because it, it would cause the skin to shrink or crack resulting in irregular pieces that you had to discard. In the case of the blue Quran, the parchment was actually painted to minimize shrinkage. After the 11th century, paper replaced parchment as the preferred support for writing and, and, and for writing and calligraphy 
One such example is the folio that I'm showing you on the screen from a multi-volume Quran dated 993 and probably produced in Iran. The proliferation and use of paper marked a major shift in the arts of the book in Iran and the rest of the Islamic world, much like the introduction of the movable press into 15th century Europe. Allegedly, paper was introduced to the Islamic world by Chinese prisoners in mid 8th century. But most probably, merchants, missionaries, and administrators in Central Asia already used paper before this time. The city of Samarkand in present day uh, uh, Uzbekistan was the first center where paper was produced. Baghdad, Cairo, and Damascus followed um, quickly, and in Iran, paper was associated with Isfahan, Tabriz, and Kashan. Unlike Chinese paper, which is made from bast or plant, a plant fiber, in Central Asia and West Asia, a largely dry and, geogra and, and arid geographic area, paper was made from rag and linen fibers, as well as old paper, which were mixed and soaked in quicklime, then washed out, ground down, and made into a pulp. The mixture was then put in mold, which would be dipped in a vat, and um, the water would escape, leaving a felt-like pulp, which was left to dry in the sun. The sheets would then be sized with either wheat, rice starch, or egg white, creating a smooth, slick surface, and, uh, which was also relatively impermeable. The papers would then be burnished and polished. The sizing and the burnishing of the surface was well suited for the reed pens, allowed the reed plant pen to glide effortlessly across the surface. When used for illustrations, however, the pigments would sit on the surface rather than sink into the paper, making paintings and manuscripts to this day uh, very fragile. And sorry, just, just want to show you in the little, in the corner um, is a, um, a drawing from a 17, early 17th century Mughal manuscript that shows you a workman actually polishing uh, the paper. To create dyed paper, unsized sheets would normally be dipped into vats of color and then left to dry as shown in this detail from a 16th century Persian painting. As you can see there, um, this is a wonderful, oops, I think you can, oh, here we go. You, you can see them dyeing the paper here and um, then hanging them here to, um, to dry. Michelle Sullivan refers to this type of type as prepared paper to suggest that the dyeing occurs after the paper has been made and dried. This is, diff this is a different process from most of the examples on view in drawing on blue, which have either blue fibers or macerated textiles or pigment added to the pulp. So um, a different process in terms of Dipping in terms of putting the, the dye into the pulp, you in Iran and the rest of the Islamic world, you would actually paint um, the surface. For prepared paper, the color could also be brushed on the surface. In most instances, it would be applied, it would be applied on both sides, but occasionally it would also be done just on one side. Once dyed, the toned paper would be fixed and left to dry. The, the two-step process of creating prepared color colored paper seems more laborious than adding colorants in to the pulp, but probably gave dyers more control over the exact shades and tones, especially in the case of the lighter toned papers. 
As mentioned in the beginning, master calligraphers repeatedly warned um, aspiring calli calligraphers against writing on white paper because it was considered too harsh on the eyes. Consequently, most Persian paper is at least cream colored or tanned, and they exhibit a considerable tonal variety. Now, today, um, some of the, um, the colors may be the, the result of a fading or discoloration, but the subtle differences must have been intentional, especially in view of the different recipes that have come down to us. To produce toned paper, the early 15th century polymath, Simine Shapuri, describes a variety of recipes using spices, plants, and other organic materials as well as minerals. Interestingly, many of the same recipes are also recommended for textiles. So to dye a textile would use the same process as dyeing paper. For a yellow dye, for example, Neshaburi suggests separating strands of saffron, placing them in a bottle, adding water, and he gives the exact proportion, closing the top and leaving it in the sun for three days. When the saffron turns straw colored, the liquid is ready to be used and should be strained and poured into a large flat vessel. The paper can then be dipped in the liquid. The longer it is kept in the solution, the stronger the color. And you can see um, saffron right on the, uh, on your <coughs> uh, on the left. According to the same author, henna also yields a natural color. First, several leaves are pulverized and placed in warm water for at least a day and a night. Then the mixture is strained and it could be used as dye. The more water is used in the mixture, the lighter the color, resembling cotton. And Neshawbury especially recommends using um, henna for coloring paper. The importance of both henna and saffron to create tan colored paper is evident in a poem by Majnune Rafiri, and the poem goes as such. A wonderful son who is filled with love, and with that love, you desire to practice writing. Go and find good paper, that it's crisp, delicate, and smooth, and has an even surface. The beautiful color that supports the calligraphy is made from henna dye or saffron. Turmeric, a spice found in much of Asia, was also used to give paper a natural tone. Likewise, safflower, a thistle-like plant, can, can produce a yellow-like uh, colorant. It could be combined with uh, sodium bicarbonate and lemon juice to create red color dye. Blue and purple could be obtained from crushed sunflower seeds and indigo was derived from a plant native to India, but also grew, which also grew in Iran. Its feathery like leaves, which you can see on the bottom there, are soaked and fermented in water and then mixed with a base to create indigo dye. Many of these organic elements were combined to create secondary dyes. For example, to obtain pink, Simine Shaburi recommends mixing saffron and lac, an insect secretion. The rose, this rose color was extremely popular and also inspired uh, many uh, lines of poetry, including this one from the 17th century, which reads by Lisa Nishirazi, which reads as follows. I had rosy paper in my room. It reminded me of flowers and the beloved's face. To achieve orange, Simine Shaburi suggests a mixture of saffron and safflower. For a green colorant, a combination of indigo and safflower was recommended. 
Verdigris, a mixture of copper and vinegar, was another way of creating green. The importance of using tinted paper for writing suggests that it must have been introduced not long after the uh, paper became uh, widespread in the 11th century. But very little has survived before the 13th and early 14th century. One example is from a now dispersed Quran copied in gold on dyed indigo paper, clearly emulating the earlier blue Quran. And this has been attributed to North Africa as well. Other examples belong to the better known pink or Andalusian Quran, of which this bifolio is in the Getty collection. In Syria, Iraq, and Iran, the earliest surviving uh, manuscript on paper um, that is dyed um, are less lofty and are medical or ethical treatises recalling re the more mundane use of blue paper in Italy for wrapping paper or making lists. And um, um, both these manuscripts are in the Chester Beatty Library in Dublin, and I'm grateful to Elaine Wright for sharing them with me. The rise of Tamur, or Tamerlane, and his descendants in the early 15th century and their patronage for the arts of the book transformed the look of the manuscript their style, formats, and materials. In addition to illustrated and unillustrated texts dedicated to a single author, Timurid patrons commissioned compendia of different genres, religious, historical, scientific, and literary works packed in one volume. And I'm showing you one example um, on, the, um, on the screen of a manuscript that um, consists of several different texts um, as well as um, illustrations. Poetic anthologies are, um, also became popular. To, um, to structure the design and content of these codices, clearly defined zones for the text, the illustrations, and the marginal designs were developed. And more attention was devoted to the materiality of the works. Concurrent with these changes in the formal appearance of manuscripts, Timurid commercial and diplomatic relations with the rest of Asia, especially China, dramatically transformed the dynasty's visual culture. Between 1413 and 1427, the Timurid and Ming courts exchanged five embassies each one surpassing the other in diplomatic pomp and material splendor. The fabulous gifts that came with the Chinese envoys inspired Timurid artists to experiment with new formal and technical ideas, thus expanding the traditional artistic canon. According to contem contemporary sources, a Chinese embassy arrived in Herat from Beijing in 1417, comprising 300 horsemen. Among the many gifts they brought for the Temurid ruler, Shah Rukh, were falcons, horses, ceramics, silks, money, and Chinese paper. Although the paper is not described, Yu Sen Yu has recently suggested that it may have been gold sprinkled, for subsequent Timurids sent uh, several specific requests to the Ming court for this particular type of paper. The arrival of Chinese colored paper in Iran had a profound impact on 15th century production. The paper is smooth, glossy, and heavy and comes in several brilliant colors, ranging from deep yellow, glossy pink, 
to soft lavender, burnt orange, and smoky blue. It can be plain gold, it can be plain gold sprinkled or sprinkled and decorated with a variety of designs. These include rippling waves, melons, pomegranates, idyllic landscapes, or birds on branches, which cover uh, much of the surface of the papers. And on, these, um, screen, on the screen, I'm showing you um, two examples. One, uh, I don't know if this is working. Ah, you see um, a bit of a landscape here, and on here, there are um, two sort of pomegranates hanging into the uh, folio. Gold sprinkled paper may have been available in China prior to the 15th century, but none has survived. There are, however, examples from 12th century Japan, and the technique may have traveled from China to uh, may have traveled from Japan to um, China during the Ming period. But this is this is a, a hypothesis that needs to be verified. In her study, Yu Sen Yu refers to a Chinese text known as the Treatise of Superfluous Things. Don't you love that title? I had to get this in in the talk. Which describes the very quantity, qualities of Chinese gold sprinkled paper. The treatise claims that the paper was colored, gold sprinkled, and heavy, and reserved exclusively for the Ming court, where it was used as frontispieces for hand scrolls. In Iran and in Central Asia, on the other hand, it was used for calligraphy. After the 15th century, the art of gold sprinkling became one of the most prominent ways to color paper in Iran. Known as Zarafshan in Persian, the term also refers to the scattering of coins, a sign of generosity and largesse. In Temurid Iran, the cities of Herat and Mashhad were the first to create gold sprinkled paper. The flecking could vary from fine and barely visible dusting to rather large particles on the page. It was reserved both for the central space of the text as well as the margins. And on the screen, I'm showing you examples of both the very fine dusting that you can see um, on uh, the area where the main text is, a different kind of dusting in the, um, in the margins, and then these sort of large flecks um, in another example. To achieve, to achieve mist-like effects, the surface of the paper would first be covered with starch. Then a horsehair brush would be dipped in gold, suspended in a solution, and flicked across the surface. If using large specks, the gold would be passed through a canvas sieve over starched paper. Once the starch was dry, the surface would be polished and ready for writing. Chinese paper must have appeared in rolls um, at the Timorit court. And then it would be cut up in different sizes depending on the format of a specific manuscript. What is interesting is there seemed little interest to align the designs to the layout of the page or adjust the placement of the design in order to maximize their visibility. So what you see here, uh, you see again a, oops, sorry. You see the landscape sort of going um, vertically, whereas the text was going horizontally. Frequently, the direction of the text would, would run counter to that of the image, negating the idea of any formal relationship between image and text. The motif seemed almost irrelevant and treated as mere decorative features, meant primarily to heighten the paper's brilliance and surface quality. 
several, um, several designs have been reconstructed to understand more fully their scale and scope across the Chinese paper. And this is an example from the um, British Library um, that has been reconstructed by Ursula Sims Williams. The attitude towards the heavily sprinkled papers is also noteworthy. In some instances, the density and size of the, size of the gold flecks is, are such that they often obscure the text, including that of the Quran. Clearly, this was no concern for the calligrapher, who still used the paper for transcribing the sacred text. Recently, scientific analysis on Chinese paper has also yielded exciting new information. According to Ilsa Sturkenbaum and her colleagues, the colorants are painted in a thick layer, either with a brush or with a spatula on the surface and then coated. One of the surprising discoveries is the fact that a considerable amount of lead can be detected in the folios, which gives the folios an unexpected weight. Further examination is needed, however, to determine if the lead was added to the pulp or applied as a thin layer below the colorant. And I look forward to the conservators and scientists in the audience to help us out here. Produced between 1437 and 1498, Persian manuscripts with Chinese paper fall into three categories, Qurans and mystical poetry, as well as treatises on Sufism, the mystical branch of Islam. The earliest copies, earliest copy is a collected work by the poet Saadi and is dated to 1437. It was created at the Timurid court in Shiraz in southwestern Iran. Others were completed in Herat, at, which was the subsequent Timurid court in present-day Afghanistan. In the latter part of the 15th century, um, as Timurid power began to decline and Turkmen Confederation seized control of much of central and western Iran, manuscripts with Chinese paper were also commissioned in Baghdad and Tabriz, the Turkmen administrative centers. Works like this treasury of secret that I'm showing you on the screen, um, which was completed in 1478 for a Turkmen patron, uh, is an important uh, sign to indicate that this Chinese paper, the Chinese paper was still available 40 years after it was first introduced to Iran. It is also important to remember that in the mid 15th century, trade between China and, um, and Timurid Iran ceased. So um, the, the quantities of this paper and their availability is somewhat of a mystery. The supply must have moved from one workshop to another, perhaps with different patrons or artists or both. Although the treasury of secrets that you see on the screen is relatively small in scale, the entire text is written on blue Chinese paper, suggesting both its importance as a commission and the availability of an entire roll of colored paper for this manuscript. With their brilliant hues, dazzling surfaces, and notable weight, never mind the content, the folios of these manuscripts offer an unprecedented multi-sensory experience. In a highly orchestrated manner, they beckon the viewer to read, look, touch, and turn the pages. Repeatedly, they draw attention away from the text, which in certain light is almost illegible, to focus on the colored and embellished pages. The weight of the paper 
adds another sensory element to the manuscript. As the reader or viewer carefully turns the pages, conscious of each one. Together, all these elements slow down the experience of the volume and heighten its objectness. Probably inspired by Chinese imported paper, artists also experimented with local paper and uh, various colorants. The tones um, included lavender, yellow, blue, rose, and green. And you see two early examples on the, um, on the screen. These were reserved primarily for literary works, espe especially poetic anthologies. The volumes for which these papers were used also differed in size and shape. And now we are in the um, sort of in the later period of the uh, 15th century. In addition to the traditional rectangular format, smaller, narrower, and oblong sh shape manuscripts became popular. Known as safine, meaning a vessel or a boat in Persian, this new format was easily portable and could be tucked into a sleeve or a belt, allowing the owner to carry it around, hence the analogy to a boat. The text consisted of ghazals, short lyrical poems, usually on the theme of love. The shape and size of the safine also challenged the paper makers, calligraphers, illuminators, and painters to experiment with new artistic and technical ideas. And here, paper will play an important role. A series of anthologies from the 1480s and 1490s created for the Turkmen courts exemplify the spirit of artistic innovation that prevailed at their courts. These relatively small manuscript, manuscripts represent a kaleidoscopic collection of colored papers, designs, and paintings. They must have also been costly production as they uh, required the expertise of many different artists and may have been created in the same workshop or at least in the same city. An early precursor, probably completed in either Shiraz or Herat for a Timurid patron, and now in the Chester Beatty Library, is dated to 1449. This remarkable safine uh, includes tinted paper, now this is local tinted paper, illumination and paintings, as well as a new manner of coloring surfaces by using stencils. As it's done today, the paper would be covered with a cut, cut out stencil and the area around it would be sprayed with a horsehair brush. When the stencil is removed, the covered area is white. Sometimes the contours of the stencils are um, outlined in gold and in the instances in the two examples here on the screen on the left and the right, they're also painted. The areas of the text now float on a carpet of finely colored and designed paper. Once again, encouraging the reader to slow down and look at every element a page offers. In some instances, even the text has been transformed into a pattern as lines zigzag across the surface, lending more a visual prominence to the overall design of the page than the poetic content. And you see that um, here. And in this one, it's impossible to know where to even start reading the lines unless you know the poem. The meticulously arranged visual effect of a safine also appealed to Persian artists and Turkmen patrons who drew and elaborated on Timurid models to combine materials and techniques 
to create their own intimately scaled and portable treasuries. An anthology dated to 1483, now in Switzerland, exemplifies Turkmen fascination with decorated paper. And I'm grateful to Simon Rettig for uh, bringing this work to my attention. The anthology includes several gold-dusted indigo-colored sheets uh, echoing Chinese aesthetics, but it also incorporates new types of tone paper. Some are painted in a smoky black and inscribed with gold. Others consist of silver-coated sheets with almost invisible black ink. I mean, there is uh, writing on here, as you can see, but it's very difficult um, to read. As the reader makes his way through such a manuscript, each opening offers a different and surprising combination of color and design. Artists also began to explore ways to lend paper texture, I mean, formal, I mean, visual texture. Mostly done in reddish brown tones, the surfaces of these examples are covered with a web of fine rivulets which flow in specific direction, suggesting that the sheets were manipulated and tilted in one direction or another during the process. The exact technique still needs to be determined, but according to our conservator, Rea De Stefano, the designs could have been created by first applying colorants with, um, with a mixture of adhesive and fixing it to um, a paste paper. A wet sheet would then be put on top and the, uh, the um, design would transfer. This is a process that was later also used in Europe. Alternatively, the design, especially on this unusual red folio, could have resulted from allowing colorants to flow over the paper with gravity to create random channels. In another instant, the paper has a blotched appearance as if the artist has flicked his brush over the surface, anticipating Jackson Pollock's strip paintings centuries later. A further opening in the Bodmer Anthology, um, the anthology is in a collection called the Bodmer, so it's known as the Bodmer Anthology, is worthy of attention. Here, the paper is decorated with a diamond-shaped lines or tide lines in light brown. Pronounced red dots in the center of each, with pronounced red dots in the center of each unit. According to De Stefano, the brown ink may have been, may have contained oxgall or another agent that would move the colorant in certain directions. The circles would then be added with a soft cloth. Now, there is no other example of this particular type of paper. And um, again, it shows the inventiveness of um, the Turkmens and their uh, desire to explore the aesthetic potential of colored paper. An unpublished poetic anthology of the late uh, 15th century now in the collection of the Museum of Islamic Art in Doha, represents a microcosm of Turkmen decorated paper. Here, known ghazals on, uh, appear on different colored surfaces and are combined with intricate illumination and imaginative sten stencil designs, creating a dynamic tension between the text and its material support. The Safine also includes examples of gold-sprinkled uh, gold sprinkled and painted Chinese paper in different tones. Um, there's an example on the <coughs> extreme um, left and then 
um, the third piece is also on Chinese, um, on Chinese paper. The well-thumped volume must have been an important work. It is covered with imperial Indian inspection seals and an inscription confirming that it was in the Royal Library in Agra, India in 1537, which coincides with the reign of Emperor Homayun, the second ruler of Mughal India. The preoccupation with paper in late 15th century Iran was also instrumental in the development of another important decorative technique, namely the art of marbling or abri, clouded in Persian or Ibru in Turkish. As with other types of paper, colored paper, abri was done sheet by sheet. Once a bath of gum, algae, or processed fenugreek seeds had been prepared, the color is added in small drops on the mucilage. Using, using small combs or rods, designs can be drawn into the dense surface. A piece of paper would be put on the surface, the design would transfer, and uh, you have your designed um, folios. An inscription on the reverse of this sheet, dated 1496, and you see it on the right, um, identifies this as the first example of ab abri paper from Iran dated 14, uh, 1496. It was a gift um, to the ruler of the kingdom of Mandu in India. Although endlessly variable and variegated, early marble paper, paper, marble designs were relatively simple and used were mainly used for framing literary text. With the rise of the Safavids in the early 16th century, the designs became more and more complicated with a dazzling array of colors and mesmerizing designs. The technique also spread to Ottoman Turkey and Mughal India, where it was further refined and elaborated. This was especially the case in India, where marbling was used to create these otherworldly and highly sophisticated compositions that I show you on, um, on the screen. Clearly, you can see that um, a form of stencil was used, because here, the stencil is used um, for <coughs> sort of block everything else and do the emaciated donkey, and on this, um, on, on the other page, is the uh, reverse. As David Roxburgh has aptly observed, the 16th century was also the period when a new attitude to the page took root. Instead of using a single sheet, artists assembled several smaller fragments some carrying verses, others prose, still others a drawing or a painting, and made it, and collaged it into a larger whole. Each element was at once autonomous, but also integral to a larger aggregate, the paper, which made up, which made up manuscripts as well as albums, and they were bound together with similar pages over, I mean, similar pages throughout these works. Drawing on the artistic innovation and imaginative spirit of the previous century, Safavid artists appropriated, distilled, and refined, rather than sub supplanted, earlier formal and technical innovation. Still valuing virtuosity of their predecessors, they sought to maximize the visual impact of the page by continuing to underscore the dynamic tension between the act of seeing and the act of reading. And in these pages, um, you, show, you can see how each um, square is really a different color. You have blue here, very different from the blue here. These are different. Um, and then the borders are <coughs> different as well. 
in the um, example in the middle, again, the, the, the main text, which is from uh, a classic Yusuf and Zuleikha, is surrounded by this sort of fantastic border with animals that has nothing to do with the text itself. But now sort of using uh, both paper and its design to really augment the writing. And then the, the, the piece on the, <coughs> uh, on the left, sorry, on the right, again, I think it, it needs a little explanation. You, you sort of have a combination of marble paper, uh, different kinds of marble paper, one for the border, one for the text, and then different colored um, papers for uh, the remaining <coughs> uh, poetic, uh, 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 poetic examples. So in many instances, the designs, which were, whether it was marbled or stenciled, uh, were unrelated to the text and offered an alternative to the also to the illustrations that randomly appeared in the volume. So it was another form of, of illustration. This new attitude to the page and the underlying aesthetic was not confined to Iran, but also apparent in Mughal India and Ottoman Turkey, where artists developed their own formal and technical vocabulary to emphasize the endless potential of their materials. And I'm showing you an example from Ottoman Turkey that, um, that of course has the uh, wonderful detailed marbling uh, in the borders, but then the central piece is actually cut out calligraphy on one sheet, then put superimposed on, an, on a slightly different colored sheet to make this very light, subtle uh, contrast. Here are two examples from Mughal India, where again, much like the um, Ottoman piece that I just showed you, there are sort of layers and layers of coloring. There is, as you see on the example on the left, the central piece is blue, um, but then it's gilded. So another layer is, is, is put on top. It's very different from the borders and the, the, the frame around. And in the piece on the left, again, you have marble pieces here on both ends and <clears throat> sort of cream colored pieces enhanced with gold. As part of this artistic, as, as part of this artistic ideal, the role and function of colored paper remained central to the arts of the book. It still complemented the written word, but now also focused attention on the materiality of the surface and the visual and, sens and sensory experience of the decorated page. In short, colored paper served far more than simply ensuring that the viewer's eyes would not suffer while reading or looking. Thank you. Thank you, Masane. That was wonderful. Everyone hear me? Okay. Um, it's nearly three o'clock, but I think we have time for just a couple of questions, and we'll start with one from our online audience. Um, from Richard Ellis, I would like to know more about the possible connection between Japanese paper dyeing and the Islamic tradition. Is there anything more that you could share with us about this? Maybe, Michelle, you should answer that question. That's a, that's a very good um, very good point, um, question to ask about the tradition of dyeing uh, papers. And there, um, this is a field that should be um, explored. Our attention, at least as, you know, from looking from Iran, because the connections have always been to China. That's sort of our obvious, the sort of the first place that you go to, you sort of, or have been going to, and sort of looking, okay, what is it that the Chinese did? Because there was so much con uh, a contact between the Middle East <coughs> and China. So the obvious place is to go there. And as a result, I think we have ignored um, places like Japan. And especially when it comes to the 
especially the, the, <coughs> the dyed indigo uh, paper and the sprinkled paper, Japan definitely is a place that we should look. And um, I will promise to continue the research and look at the connection between Iran and Japan. Great, thank you. Okay, um, let me just take a look out in the crowd for any questions in the audience. Down here in the front, do we have, yeah, we have a mic runner coming. <laughs> Why don't we start from the front and then go back? Okay, that's right. Oh. Um, in the earlier history, when papers are dyed one color, are there any significance to the colors uh, versus what kind of books they're used um, in? Um, that's a very good question. And um, I'm sort of embarrassed to say I don't, I don't have the answer to that as well. Um, the study of, of co the sort of the systematic study of colored paper, especially for um, manuscripts produced um, in this region is, is relatively new. And um, again, we sort of look for parallels elsewhere. So for instance, with the indigo or the purple, we look towards Byzantium because clearly um, <coughs> when, um, when the sort of early uh, dynasty, Islamic dynasties sort of inherited the cultures and the traditions of both the Byzantium and also the Sasanians. So um, sort of looking towards them and sort of seeing what they were doing. And many of the artists actually probably continued. Sasanian artists continued to produce early manuscripts for the Muslims and probably also some Byzantine artists. But um, unfortunately, we have no sources to tell us if the colors really had particular significance. What is interesting is when you, <clears throat> especially when you look at the early examples of colored paper, the Qurans, they all come from North Africa, or at least the two, the two Qurans that we know come from North Africa or Islamic Spain. When you look further east in Iran and Syria, Iraq, you have manuscripts that are really not that important. And so, again, it doesn't really help in explaining um, if, if there was a particular relationship to the color, uh, between the manuscript and the colors. But Again, there's been renewed um, attention uh, on colored paper, and especially now we have um, all these new sort of scientific tools to examine colors and colorants. So um, we are all hoping as historians of manuscripts that we'll find out more very soon. But thank you for the question. Um. Could you explain whether the artist experiment, going from parchment to paper, did the artist experiment with different ingredients or compositions for color? You showed a, a, a miniature called um, Safavid School, showing uh, the color dyeing and drying uh, the papers. There was what looked like a stream of water coming down through a man-made pipe or canal uh, that looked black. And I was wondering if you could explain that. Um, there was also a, an image to the right, bottom right, that I couldn't figure out what they were doing to that piece of parchment. It was like hanging. Uh, um, sorry, just right. trying to. Um, it, it the black street, sorry, if I um, to remember all the different parts to that question, but thank you for the question. Um, the, the black stream actually is, but well, you needed water to, to wash. So um, the black screen here, I mean, that was silver. Usually when in Persian paintings, if you wanted to paint water, you painted it in silver. But silver actually tarnishes. So whenever you see a sort of a dark area in a manuscript, in a Persian manuscript, it's probably water that has tarnished silver that is tarnished. So this, you can see the, um, sorry, it's coming, it's coming from here, from under the terrace, and it's water, they, you know, they need water for the vat, but that's, that's um, tarnished. Um, 
uh, tarnished silver. In terms of the colorants for um, parchment versus paper, again, I'm looking at our, our paper conservator here for help. Um, but at least with the material that I've shown on that we have, there's so few examples from the early period. I mean, we have, we have the blue Quran and we have the pink Quran. And we have a few other Qurans, um, but not enough. And they haven't really been analyzed. Uh, I mean, the blue Quran is um, the only, actually the manuscript that has been recently analyzed. And hopefully with a, a page from the pink Quran being at the Getty, I hope that you will also analyze um, the, the colorants in that manuscript and actually see whether it was made of, the, you know, of lac and, and saffron the way that it's described in the manuals or something else. Oh, this is, um, I think, um, they, 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 it's, it's a water, it's a, it's a um, what do you call it? It holds water and you can see, it's probably like yogurt or something and, and there's, a, there's a, um, a sort of a little vat here and it's sort of dripping in it. Okay, we're running out of time, but maybe one more from online and one more from the audience. Okay. Um, one from online uh, from John Moore. Do we have any 15th or 16th century texts that document how users appreciated colored paper and patterns um, and objects applied to it? So. Sorry, what was the last part? Um, any documents about how users appreciated colored paper and the patterns and objects applied to it? Um, there are some, thank you for the question, there are some references of, you know, of how to appreciate and respond to color. I mean, um, there is the issue of whiteness, um, but also um, there are references to um, yellow paper and red paper. I mean, it's interesting um, that apparently red and yellow are also um, are hard on the eye. It doesn't, the, the references don't say, don't use it. They just say, I mean, it's, it's again, it's sort of, I think that sort of surprise element um, that is there for, when using um, those colors. But the manuals don't, unfortunately, tell us how people respond or responded. Um, they just tell us how things, how things were made and you sort of have to sort of imagine, you have to sort of fill in the, fill in the blanks. Okay, one more from the crowd. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for the talk. Um, I noticed a majority of the pieces shared with us today are pieces of Persian origin that are not housed in Iran um, at all. Do current sanctions make it difficult for us to access texts that are still housed at their origin site? Or was there a different artistic reason to feature these works? You caught me. <laughs> I was just being, I, you know, I, just, I was sloppy. Um, and some, Iran is right there. Um, sorry. Iran is meant to be there. Um, I just, in some of my IDs, I just, sorry, forgot and left it out. There is nothing against using Iran um, for sanctions or anything else. Um, these are amazing works of art. Uh, most of them are in the United States, others in Europe. I think I showed a few from Turkey. And all the collections that own these works are extremely proud and are extremely um, careful. They take good care of them and they all mention Iran proudly in the, um, uh, in the IDs. It was just me being sloppy. So I'm sorry, I'll, I'll take better care <laughs> next time. Uh, but thank you for pointing it out. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Well, thank you again, Masame, for such a wonderful lecture. Thank you, everyone, for attending. Um.
please be sure to visit getty.edu for more information about future exhibitions and programming. And we hope to see you all here again soon. Thank you.